morning, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, in the series of uh, our fall programs for the Dr. Forest. Get up close to it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'm a newbie at this. So here we are. Um, and because I don't know many of you, I will tell you that I'm Janet Carl, and I'm a new member of the Bucket Course Committee, and I'm happy to be so. The committee wants to tell you, um, sadly, that Joanne Bungie, the uh, founder and leader for many years of the Bucket Course, has, um, is, is no longer a part of the committee. She's had to resign because she doesn't live here anymore. She's moved to California. But I thought we'd want to uh, let her know, I'm sure she'll be watching this on tape, how much uh, we thank her for her dedication to adult education in the community. <laughs> and I have a couple of announcements. If you're using a T-coil, please turn it on now. And, in this day and age, even among us, I must say, Please turn off your phones and put them away. You'll be able to catch up on messages during our break time, which is at around 10.40. Our speaker, Bill Menner, is well known in our community. Bill's been a journalist, the director of the you know, Renaissance and how she got with development. He also did our town very proud, I think, as part of the Obama administration, working in rural development for the Department of Agriculture. Bill now consults on rural development topics as CEO of the Bill Menner Group. His topic is agriculture, small towns, and the federal government. A look at the relationship over the years. Please join me in welcoming Bill. I was waiting for my light to go green. Thanks, Janet. Uh, morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. It's great to be back. I've only been here for a onesie in the past, so the idea of a fourzie is a little intimidating. Um, be before I start, I don't know how many of you have met our new hospital CEO or not, but I'm so happy that she's here. Jennifer Havens is here, and uh, as a hospital board member, I am happy if you haven't met her yet. But to have you meet her, and I know she's been getting out a lot. Um, I've been on the hospital board since 2009. And so clearly, when we were selecting a new CEO, it was something that was new to almost the entire board. Only Ed Hatcher had had any experience picking a CEO, and that's because he was on the board 24 years ago when we hired Todd Linden. So um, this was, oh my Jack was here, but you're not on the board today. No. But Jack was here too. Years ago, yeah. That was so. Anyway, we didn't have any experience. We had great candidates who wanted to come to Grinnell, and we were so happy to have Jennifer with us. So welcome. Um, I am not a native of rural America. You all may know that. Uh, I grew up on the west side of Cleveland, Ohio. So when I came to Grinnell almost, well, just over 28 years ago this month, we got here the third week of August in 1990, when my wife got bar got a job teaching at Grinnell College. Um, we packed up from Columbus, Ohio and came here, and 28 years later, here we are. And somehow in that time, I have become a de facto expert in rural America and agriculture and the history of Grinnell. Uh, which is great. But I still have people back home on the west side of Cleveland who say, what the heck do you know about rural development? And my answer is, well, osmosis is a really great thing because that's how I have, I have learned about uh, living in a, in a small town, um, working for the president and for the secretary of agriculture and supporting rural communities and agriculture and businesses that will help drive the future of agriculture so I come to you not as, as someone who was born and bred uh, in a small town or in a rural place, but as someone who has um, come to it voluntarily and stuck, stuck around. I, I've, I've told this story many times. When we first got here, uh, I was getting my, my driver's license. 
And at the time, you could sign up for a two-year license or a four-year license. And I said, give me the two-year license, because <laughs> we're going to be gone. <laughs> and then a kid came, and another kid came, and another kid, and the rest is history. <laughs> uh, over these four Wednesdays, um, my hope is that we will have as much a dialogue as a lecture. Because frankly, I, I almost guarantee you that most of you know more about the history of rural America and agriculture and the role of the federal government than I do. So uh, we, we, there will be a Q&A session at the end of each session, but I'm going to give you opportunities to jump in. And whether Jan, Janet gets to you with a microphone or you shout out your question and I repeat it, there, there, this will be a dialogue. In fact, the fourth session, um, we're going to replicate something that uh, one of my clients, the Iowa Rural Development Council, is doing right now. We're supporting the governor's office in her Empower Rural Iowa initiative. And we're holding meetings across the state. She appointed the task force to look at some important issues from broadband to housing to how do we grow the next generation of rural leaders. Well, the Rural Development Council is helping to facilitate those conversations. And I think we're gonna have something very similar in the fourth week of this. It'll almost be a town hall that I will frame with conversations that are going on. Because frankly, the 66 people that the governor appointed to this task force don't know everything. Uh, my hope is that you can add some value to some of the ideas that they're generating. The governor said, give me some ideas that we can use to develop new public policy, new legislation, new ideas. And whether it's Kim Reynolds or Fred Hubble, I think those recommendations are going to bring value. And honestly, I'm happy to be the messenger with more ideas from the people in this room about what we can do to make small towns like ours um, better places uh, where people want to live and stay and have more kids and you know have a great life which, which is what I've done for the last 28 years we're going to talk this morning we're going to create some benchmarks we're going to talk about the way things used to be we're going to talk about the way things are today um, and broadly some of the tools and rationale the government uses or has for treating small towns and rural places and farmers and producers differently. Um, next week, we're going we're gonna to dive into um, things like rural electrification uh, and the extension of telephone services to rural places. And, and that really important today of broadband and why is broadband so similar to electricity um, back in the New Deal era, um, should there be a New Deal for broadband in rural places? We're going to talk about that next week. The following week we'll get into conservation and farm policies and other roles the government plays. This is all because rural America is a sparsely populated place. And if you rely on the private sector to come in and make uh, investments in sparsely populated areas, they will look at their return on investment and they will say, and have said, no thank you. So that, that's the rationale for government involvement in rural places. And we'll be talking about that over these four weeks. And then week four will be, will be a free for all. Um, we, we will have a conversation about where we're going. So I hope that this first, this first session will be a, a sort of a primer for how we're going to get to week four and frankly, how we're going to make our, our community a better place, communities. Uh, I noted that um, a majority of voters uh, voted for the bond levy yesterday. Unfortunately, state law doesn't, doesn't give you the option of a majority rule. You have to have a supermajority. We did not have a supermajority. So I know that there is some consternation in town today about what is our fu future from an education standpoint. Um, that is not an area where the federal government gets involved for the, from a funding perspective for the most part, but those are decisions that rural communities are making and rural leaders are making, and it certainly is fair game for part of our conversation about how do communities think strategically about their futures and who's at the table. So I spent nine years, all, well, I, let me take that back. 
I spent almost eight years, seven and a half, um, running an agency of the Department of Agriculture that sole focus is on small towns. People would look at the at USDA, and Tom Vilsack was my boss, and it's an ocean liner of a department. There were over 100,000 employees, and, and I was in this little agency called Rural Development, and we were like, of that ocean liner, we were the, the you know, the inner-facing, you know, cabin on the Lido deck. We were tiny. Um, because there's the, there's the Forest Service, there's food stamps, there's farm programs. Uh, it's a huge department, and there we were, this tiny agency. And yet, our agency, if we were a bank, we would have been one of the ten largest banks in the world because we had a portfolio of a quarter of a trillion dollars in loans and loan guarantees for projects in small towns. Whether it's a water system or a sewer system, or helping somebody buy a house, or helping to finance a hospital emergency department, I did here, um, or, or helping a small business succeed. Rural development was that, was that infrastructure bank, that business bank. And so I had a great experience. I got to run around the state for almost eight years, waving my arms, telling small towns to use these resources, to, to think strategically about their future, and to celebrate the fact that they lived in small towns. And, and at the end of the day, people would say, why is the United States Department of Agriculture worried about rural health care, or rural education, or rural housing, or rural water? And my response would be, do you like to eat? Because those small towns are the backbone of American agriculture. And without those small towns, farmers don't have access to Healthcare, education, church, grocery store, um, off farm income today, all important elements. So that's why the government's involved, because agriculture is important, and without these rural places, uh, agriculture is not going anywhere. So that's my long um, preface to our four week journey that we have. And again, I, I, I encourage you to. To, to wave your arms at me or just shout at me, um, and I'll repeat your shout so everyone can hear it. Um, but, but this is a conversation. And, and I started, when I started thinking about this first session, I first thought about Thomas Jefferson and his vision for an agrarian society. You know, but I also, just thinking about this now, I saw the, the little posters walking into the library. With a, There's a school age, fourth grade and up, um, class on the musical Hamilton and I saw that Hamilton poster and you know after seeing and seeing Hamilton and reading the Chernow book Hamilton you know I'm not I mean Thomas Jefferson and his agrarian vision I'm not too keen on that anymore he was the father of the Democratic Party and I'm a Democrat but um, but Jefferson's vision for an agrarian society may be not in line with the reality of America, whether it was in the 18th century or today. Um, but until not too long ago, we were an agrarian society. And when you think about, in your lifetimes, how things have changed, and where, where we have been uh, as a rural community, uh, and, and what sorts of resources and equipment and what life was like. I mean, Art and I were, were talking about his 60 plus years in uh, Grinnell and in Iowa and thinking about uh, the fact that you all in your lifetimes have seen, I was gonna say cataclysmic, but that's not the right word. You've seen a, a, a complete tsunami of change in technology, whether it's urban technology, but think about what's happened on the farm and what's happened in our small towns in just your lifetimes. So I, I will turn 57 in a few weeks. So I've seen a little bit, um, and the changes since 1961 have been significant, but there are folks in this room who have seen a, a, a change unlike any change in the history of mankind. And, and what has happened in our rural communities um, has, has changed exponentially. But at the end of the day, what, you know, what, what does rural America have? Um, 
we, well, we're the source of an inexpensive and safe food supply, unparalleled in the world. We spend less for our food as a percentage of our GDP than in any other country on Earth. Um, we're a source of affordable and renewable energy. Uh, we're a source of clean and plentiful drinking water. Uh, rural America is a source of great natural resources and a, a, a place to have outdoor recreation that we can enjoy. We have all these things in Grinnell or in Powasheet County at our fingertips. And, and then we start thinking about how things used to be. And, and certainly we had less sophisticated equipment. Uh, we were at Dairy Barn a couple nights ago and we always kind of wander around the implements next door and those implements versus this implement is, is a little different than we have. Um, farms were smaller and, and much more plentiful. They were, you know, family farms that were handed down over generations to um, young people who wanted to stay on the farm and often did, and you had clusters of families living in close proximity. And you still have that to a degree. The number of farms today is, is dramatically smaller than it was 50 years ago, for example, in this picture. But back then, yields were smaller. I mean, as, as hybrid seeds have changed and GMOs have come and, and technology has advanced uh, in, with the Monsantos and the Cargills of the world, and we have seen tremendous changes in how much producers can grow. And what does that mean? A lot of our corn goes to energy right now. A lot of it goes to livestock feed, and there's still more than we know what to do with. So the idea that uh, farmers back then were producing a lot less was, was significant. How, how many of you grew up on a family farm? Um, what, what, am I, what am I missing as far as those changes, whether it's on the farm, lifestyle-wise, or technology-wise, or production style-wise? Any, any thoughts that, of things that I could add to my list of, of those major changes? Reliance on the family to support the total project. Reliance on the family. Um, the family members, uh, not necessarily hired hands, um, or, or, I mean, today in many uh, rural places and rural production facilities, we rely on immigrant labor. Um, immigrants are an important source for, for farms today. That was not the case back then, was it? Right. Other, other suggestions, things I'm missing? Yes, Otto. Uh, what I've come to realize is that people who grew up on the farm and people who lived, grew up in the town, people who lived uh, in a, on a farm, grew up on a farm, and folks that uh, grew up in town, even though they may have gone to the same school, there's a having grown up in a city, uh, I was out and about and lots of opportunities and lots of people that I interacted with, whereas I found out that a lot of people who lived out in the country 50 years ago or more uh, didn't have the social experiences that people live in the city. They, they didn't grow up with as many people, harder to find a date, um, and the technology, you know, the, the, as far as plumbing and telephone, electricity, and and so on, uh, it, it, there, and we see this in Iowa now, and certainly in, in Powasheet County, you know, uh, two, two cultures that really haven't come together yet. Well, I, I one one note I'll make, and that prompts me to, to move my my cursor ahead, is um, cities were the social hub many years ago. And I can't tell you how many times when I was running Grinnell Renaissance, people would share with me how things were back in, the, for example, in the 50s, when Friday or Saturday nights in downtown Grinnell were packed with people. And of course, downtown, uh, downtown Grinnell or downtown, I mean, Jim White has told me that downtown Malcolm used to be like, and, and how these small towns have changed. You had retail everywhere in a downtown and it was the, the shopping and commercial center for let's just say a 20 mile radius we jump in the car today and we're in altoona in no time at the outlet mall or we're at jordan creek and you know the reliance on on small town retail today has changed dramatically 
as is the case with with doubts with with small town um, recreation and socialization. The the idea that people like to spend time at home, or they jump in the car and drive to Des Moines to see a movie or go to a restaurant. We don't have that same idea of everyone gathering downtown and shopping on Saturday nights or hanging out in the park. We have some opportunities, but it's, we're not the primary source of, of recreation and entertainment and socialization that we used to be. And those opportunities that we do have to bring people together are really important. Uh, we had a picnic in Central Park on Sunday night, and we had over 120 people there. And it was a remarkable celebration of, of uh, community and good food and, and fun. And I know that the Chamber tries to create opportunities for that sort of collective celebration. Uh, when I was booking music in the park, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, again, the attempt was to bring people together, give them opportunities to, to have fun. Uh, you know, I, I have had... Um, uh, conversations with the state directors, multiple directors of cultural affairs over the years. And one of the reasons they always point out to me that arts and culture is, is important in a small town is that, you know, you have to have the opportunity if you live in a small town to have fun. You, you have home, you have work, and you have to have play. Otherwise, you're not creating that third place and that opportunity to create um, a broad-based lifestyle. And you, we don't want people to have to drive to Des Moines to have fun, so we have to create opportunities. People used to have fun, I suspect, on Saturday nights. Did, how many of you are, experienced one of those Saturday nights in the 50s or 60s where everybody and their cousin came downtown? Um, I mean, it was different back then. And, and those sorts of, um, I mean, so, I used to have, for, for a few years, while I was working in Des Moines with USDA, I was driving so much, I actually got a small apartment at the corner of 13th and Locust, right by the Sculpture Park. It was a studio apartment, it was 600 bucks a month, it was 500 square feet, it had a bed and a chair and a refrigerator. But it also looked out on the John Papa John uh, Business Center, but Locust Street ran, was right, right there. And, if I stayed at that apartment on a Saturday night, the, the, the people scooping the loop in Des Moines would go until 3 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep, so I wound up not staying in Des Moines on Saturday nights. I know that's what happened here. And I, I, I had to suspect it's still what happens, but not to the extent that it did many years ago. That idea that people would come into town to celebrate. Um, Am I, am I, you know, I, I know that things have changed in rural America and in rural communities, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, there are sociological and political studies on how people have changed and how they interact with their communities. You know, there was a book called Bowling Alone that talks about the fact that people don't bowl anymore, and that bowling was a great social experience where you, worked, you were part of a team. Now people watch TV all night. They don't bowl together. So there's a, I mean, it's not just focused on Grinnell or Powashee County or Iowa. This is a broader change. Um, but, it, but it certainly does reflect on how we, how we relate with our small towns, um, how our residents think about where they have to go to get what they need, whether it's food, supplies, work, fun, etc. So thinking back, I know you may not be able to read this, and frankly, I knew I wouldn't be able to read it either, so I had to print it out for myself. This is a, 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 a list of commodities that were raised on Iowa farms. At least 1% of all family farms raised these different products over the years. And so this is 1920. You can see horses and cattle are at the top. You have apples, oats mules, timothy, peaches, bees, barley, syrup, gooseberries, sweet corn, cabbage, currants. Look, look at the extent of things that Iowa farmers were growing in 1920. And then it's 1935 is here, and it's almost as long. You've got goats in there, and popcorn, and rye. 
Then you moved to 1945 and, and the list. So you, you lost one here. You lose three more here. By 1954, the, the, the diversification of farm production has dramatically changed. You know, there's turkeys and sweet potatoes, and Timothy is still on the list. By 1964, Timothy is gone, by the way, as are a lot of other products. 1978, ducks are still there. Ducks are gone in 1987, by the way. And then, oh, no, there they are, you're right. 97 or not. Imagine what that list looks like today. This was one that a friend of mine, Rich Pirog, who used to be at Iowa State, he's now at Michigan State, he's one of the smartest guys when it comes to uh, food systems and growing our own food that, that I know. And Rich did a really great study for Iowa State. But so look at, look at the change in how, what farmers produce and how diversified they are. Or you can turn that around, around and say, how reliant they are on a very narrow list of commodities. I mean, in Iowa, it's, it's corn beans and, and cattle and pigs and chickens. And, and, and we do it well. I mean, I'm looking at Donna, um, thinking about, you know, from a policy standpoint, um, the, the narrowing, um, the consolidation of our agricultural operations has made us hugely efficient, and at the same at the same time, in my mind, um, hugely vulnerable. Um, whether it's in our animals to to disease, and thinking about the bird flu a few years ago, and how many chickens and other fowl had to be destroyed to stop the spread of that disease, to you know, what, what happens if there is any sort of a, I mean, we know that climate change brings different elements to change, and that can mean pests and disease, so we don't know what happens if something ever happens, uh, a new uh, pest or disease comes that affects corn or beans. Where, where do producers go? And those are things that the government thinks about all the time. There are many producer, many scientists studying that right now. Yes, you wanted to point out something. As a former city slicker, what is Timothy? It, <laughs> isn't Timothy a, a cover crop of some kind? Yes. Uh, it has a big head on it. Maybe. Cover crop with a big head on it. Um, oh, go ahead, Janet. It just has a big fuzzy head on the end of it. Looks like a cat, like a little mini cat tail. It, uh, it, it, I mean, it, and I don't know what Timothy was used for. It was it okay? Okay. Okay. Again, city slicker. <laughs> I saw another, yes. Timothy was mainly a horse pay because of the freedom from dust. And they don't use horses on the farm anymore, so they don't feed Timothy. Tim Timothy was a hay that um, was an an basically was an antidote to, to dusty feed. And so because we have fewer horses on the farm today, we have fewer needs for Timothy. But, but I, I think, that, oh yes, go ahead. Please keep in mind this chart. Uh, later on, we talk about economic development and so on. There's been a lot of discussion about how Iowa could diversify by raising more food, uh, produce that humans can eat. And this shows that we have the capability of doing it because we have the past practice. We have produced all those things in the past. So Iowa is capable of producing all those things. It's not trying to raise something we never raised before. We, we raised all this stuff. Whereas, uh, one comment I'd like to make is if the, uh, the statement was made often that I will feed the world. Well, I, as a human being, cannot eat any of that corn or any of those soybeans that are raised by farmers in Iowa. Those are not consumable by human beings. You're, you're right, and, and I have seen, you know, op-ed pieces in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal talking. Somebody from the East Coast drives across Iowa and sees the corn and the beans and says, is it something that I can't eat any of this? But but there are applications, there are uses of that those commodity crops that are used for production. But you're you're right. I mean, if you go out to to Andy and Melissa Dunham's farm uh, or Jordan Scheibel's you know uh, farm and see what they're growing uh, and see the growing demand. And, and we're I'm kind of getting a few weeks ahead of myself here, and I'll start to get on a on a soapbox. 
but, but people are increasingly interested in what they're eating and where the food is coming from. And I will say that one of the things that the Obama administration's USDA focused on was the whole idea of local foods and local, fresh, healthy foods. And there was something developed called Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food. And it was a whole, whole attempt to drive this sort of local production and incent people like, like Andy and Melissa and Jordan to grow more local foods and to make them more available at farmers markets. And in fact, we've got some pictures later on here as we think about that. But, but that is part of the change in agriculture. Part of what farmers did um, in 100 years ago was they were, they were not just producing food, they were feeding themselves at the same time. La Forest. Now, one of the things I noticed there, a lot of those crops require a pollinator, and bees were 9% on 9% of the farms in 1920. Yep. By 1935, it was down to 5%, and by 1945, it was down to 2%, and they're disappeared from the list. And, and we, well, that's one of the things we have a crisis in today, is we, there's a shortage of bees to pollinate the crops that we aren't raising right now anyway, but still, it's something we need. If we're going to diversify, there's a lot of things we need to backtrack on and, and restore that we've, that we've eliminated in the idea a monoculture that we've had. And I share your concern about the risk that we face. Well, LaForest, his point was made a lot of these crops and the early part of this, this chart really required pollinators. And I don't know if you were at the Ag Day celebration a week ago where I was the MC, but there was a nice um, NR, uh, USDA NRCS Natural Resource Conservation Service tent, and they had um, milkweed seeds and other um, plants that help attract pollinators, both, both bees and monarch butterflies. And uh, I mean, that is a crisis right now. Um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, so, <laughs> you know, thinking about quality of life and, and rural places, you know, here's, here are a few things that we know about rural Iowa and rural America. Um, we earn less than our counterparts in big cities from an income standpoint. Uh, we live shorter lives, and that has something to do with access to health care in a lot of places. How far do you have to travel to get to see a doctor? We're so fortunate here. But, but there are people who have to drive 40, 60, 100 miles to get to a doctor. Their life expectancy is shorter. Um, we're, as a group, less educated. We haven't, you know, there are fewer PhDs in rural America than there are in uh, urban communities, or even people with a bachelor's degree. So we're less educated. Um, what else do we know about rural America? Um, we're about 19% of the entire population of the country. So there, there are 60 million people who live in small towns. And, and you think about that, that's a lot of people. Now, they all voted for Donald Trump two years ago, so I mean, that they're a huge electorate, you know, a voting block too, but they're a huge economic force too. We're a huge economic force. Uh, it's fascinating to find out that, that more rural Americans have served in the military as a percentage of the population. And in fact, even today, Four in ten members of the military came from a small town or from a rural area. Now, the skeptics will tell you that's because they couldn't get a job back home because there were no jobs in their small town, so their only choice was to join the Army or Navy or Air Force. But, but the point is, is, that, is that there is this um, innate sense of service that comes with people in a small town, whether it's service to the military service to their community, service to their church, um, that's a thread that runs through rural places. Uh, one other note is that 36% of the veterans who get health care from the VA live in small towns. Now, when was the last time you saw a VA clinic in a small town? I actually drove past one in Knoxville, but Knoxville's the exception because they used to have a big VA hospital. We don't do a good enough job taking care of our rural veterans because we make them drive to Iowa City or Des Moines or some distant place when we could be doing a better job connecting VA services with local hospitals and clinics. And, and we don't. Um, what else do we know about small town Americans and small town Iowans? 
Uh, they're more likely to reside in the state in which they were born. They're not as transient as, as big city people like me and my siblings. Um, they're more likely to own their own home. They're more likely to have paid off their mortgage. Now that may be because it, either they're frugal or they've lived long enough that they've paid off their mortgage because they've been in their house more than 30 or 40 years. They're more likely to start a business. And they're more likely to have that small business survive for at least five years. So that, that kind of makes sense to me because in essence, farmers are, are the best small business owners we have. So there's this, this thread of entrepreneurship that runs through small towns. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, and it goes back to a comment about um, the need for immigrant labor on the farm and in small towns, is that we are becoming more diverse as rural America is. Um, and part of that is, is farm labor, part of that is packing plants, part of that is just our workforce needs. We don't have enough workers today in, in small towns in Iowa to fill the, the jobs that, that local employers need. And the question becomes, well, if who are we going to get? Well, you start bringing people from the outside in. And it just so happens that a lot of the folks that are coming into small towns to work, regardless of the job, are people who were not born in this country. So, so diversity uh, is increasing in, our, in our, our country. So, I mean, that's the inherent challenge. We're small towns. We don't, we don't have um, the, the um, density of population that they have in big cities. And density makes a lot of things easier. Of course, it changes the whole social fabric of your place. But it's easier to make investments and to get lots of people to shop at your rest or your store or eat at your restaurant when you've got 10,000 people living in your block. And, and that's a challenge. It's a good challenge sometimes. It's, a, it's one of the things that makes quality of life great but it's a challenge in a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about. Um, we're finding that younger people are moving to the big city. My kids live in Minneapolis, Chicago, and two in Washington, D.C. My hope is that they'll come back someday, if not to Grinnell, to rural Iowa, but, but they're you know spreading their wings and, and finding this out, but, but younger people are moving away from rural places. Retail on Main Street is leaving because everyone's shopping on Amazon, or going to Altoona, or to the Outlet Mall, or Jordan Creek. So we're, we see more service industries popping up in what used to be stores on Main Street. Um, manufacturing is still an important element. In fact, when people in, I would go to DC and have meetings, and they'd say, well, you probably have nothing but farms and, and value-added producers. And i say, no, we got manufacturers. Manufacturers like rural America because people work hard, the land is cheap, the energy is cheap, and they don't have to pay as high wages. So in fact, manufacturing is a huge economic driver in rural America. And today, unlike 100 years ago, we have fewer family farms, and many of the ones that we do have are huge. And that's why they need those giant farm implements that we see on the east edge of town or the south edge of town because they're doing thousands of acres. So I'm going to leave you, let's, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to wet your whistle. No, I'm not. I'm not going to make you look at that chart. We're going, to, we're going to take a break. I'm going to be milling about, so feel free to tackle me. I might tell you, save that comment for after the break. But we'll come back in a few minutes, and we'll start talking about the numbers about rural America and start talking about the federal role. So, Here's a commercial break. Janet, anything I need to say? Ten minutes. Uh, a few folks came out to me during the break and mentioned what was what was what was like for them on Saturday nights. Someone who uh, someone who grew up next door to a country school mentioned that all the kids would go back to school on weekends and have potlucks and play music, and that was where their social time was on, on Saturday nights, was at the country school. Uh, Monty Rodinius was mentioning to me that on Saturday nights, they'd go downstairs and stand outside the hardware store, because the hardware store would put a TV in the window and face it out, so there'd be a crowd of people crowded around the window at the hardware store watching TV.
white, black and white. That's right. So I'm going I'm to bore you with a few graphs just for a second. These just demonstrate the fact that rural populations are declining. The, the, the top, the green is metro, the blue is the U.S. average, and red is non-metro, which means us, rural. Th this is a map. Um, I can tell you that dark colors mean the place is growing. Light colors, peach colors, means that it's not growing, uh, declining, and the gray means it's urban. Um, and again, it just kind of states the obvious. There are fewer people living in rural communities today, or they're heading for the heading for the big city. And here's another one. Blue is loss. Peach. So a blue area means it's a rural place that's losing population. Uh, the the light co color tan means that the population is growing, but by five percent or less. And the dark brown means the population is exploding. Um, Five percent or more growth. That for me, let me see, I, can, uh, I guess I don't know how to use the coin. If I had, if I could use the, uh, the, the blazer beam, I would point to Western North Dakota. That's the oil patch. That's where people are, are paying $2,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment because they're all working in the, uh, the oil refineries with the fracking and the oil patch. So it'll be interesting 10 years from now to look at this same map and see what the change in, in Western North Dakota is then uh, to see if that, if that demand for workers is as great as it was. I flew into the airport once in Dickinson, North Dakota, and they only had three gates but there was a huge construction program because they were going to be tripling the size of the airport to accommodate all the workers who would come in for two weeks and work on the oil patch and live in a man camp uh, and then go home for you know a week and and but basically they were they were itinerant workers making a heck of a lot of money for dangerous work yes art what's the big growth in northeast nevada northeast nevada i have no idea uh, there, there is, there's a big spot there. Um, I, I can't tell you. Um, that was the question, was Northeast, yes, Otto. Oh, Tahoe Oh, is that Tahoe there? Okay, well that, well it's not Tahoe. A military base. Oh, okay, Donna says it's a military base. So they're hiring more, more. It is, um, this kind of tan, like we're talking about in North Dakota, the, you know, the, the boom. Yes. It's going to be a bust. Is that what, what, what you know, I don't want to get ahead of your show here, but uh, is that a healthy thing for rural America is to have a boom town and then a big airport and then everybody goes home in the airport? The scary. interesting thing about that part of North Dakota is they've had energy booms in the past. And a, a certain segment of the population up there is very skeptical of, of whether this was going to last. And that's why they were reticent to invest in their facilities. So that's why you'd have these, these remarkable camps of campers, man camps, pop up. Because the towns weren't willing to invest in housing and other facilities because they weren't convinced that the boom was going to last. So it's a great question. And should the question then is, should a rural place invest that sort of resource in that sort of uh, an economy? I'll tell you that, that fracking and oil is a heck of a lot different from wind and solar. Um, the wind is not going to go away. And, and those turbines, now you may have to change the blades now and again or, or change the mechanisms because it's a moving part. There's always going to be wind. There's always going to be sun. And I think those have to be key elements for a rural economy is how do we become more self-sufficient from an energy standpoint. Um, would, and, and, and someone's going to have to build these turbines and service them. So I think there are economic opportunities there. I just don't know that I would be the person who said I want to put all my money into fracking. Yes? What is the one little orange dot in southeastern Iowa? Well, the little, uh, I want to say, in my mind, that has to be Fairfield. That has to be Jefferson County. And I think that's because Fairfield is this unique economy that's got the Maharishi University um, School of Management there. 
They've got arts and culture, and they have a, a group of people from around the world that are coming to Fairfield because they want to be part of Maharishi. Yes, Donna. And they also have two solar companies. It's two solar companies and two broadband companies. It's a very entrepreneurial place. There is certainly conflict in Fairfield and Jefferson County between the practitioners and the non-practitioners, but they've been at it long enough now that they're, you know, I think that some of the tension is resolving. But, but Fairfield, if you've ever been able to go down there on the, the first Friday of the month, they have an art walk. They have a number of art galleries in downtown Fairfield, and they have hundreds of people who walk from gallery to gallery and look at arts and, and eat good food. There's a huge number. In fact, somebody from Fairfield has told me that they have more restaurants per capita than San Francisco. <laughs> and he has repeated it often enough that it's taken for truth. I don't know if that's the case, but they do have a remarkable number of restaurants in Fairfield, and many of them are vegetarian. And it all has to do with the, Ma with the Maharishi uh, University and with the practitioners, and, and it's driving their economy. And a huge organic um, uh, culture. Um, so Fairfields are, that, that would be my hunk about, a uh, hunk, hunk of cheese, hunk about, the hunch about Southeast Iowa. So you know, there, you know, that, that's a, I didn't intend for that to be the, the segue to this, but in fact, it is a great segue that there are places that are doing really amazing things. This is a picture from Life Magazine from the early 80s. This is Greenfield, Iowa. And Greenfield has some remarkable things going on. Uh, many of you knew Dan Tyndall, um, uh, our recently departed architect from town. Dan was involved in the restoration of the uh, hotel, the Hotel Greenfield did a great job, and that was part of a broader um, revitalization yes. of Greenfield and the community and the downtown. They have a great Main Street program. And, and this was just the title of the article, The Joys of Small Town Living. I mean, enough said. I mean, it's a, it's a small town, you're, you're, you know people, the quality of life is good, you don't have to lock your door. My kids would ride their bikes around and I wouldn't know where they were, but I knew that wherever they were, that someone would tell me if they were getting in trouble. And that's how it was when I grew up, too. Um, so there are the, these, these key elements of life in a small town that, that are the reason that people come to live here or choose to stay here. And when I was the economic developer uh, here, I made sure that every piece we had that tried to attract someone to either live here or bring a business here that there was a kid alone on a bike. Um, because for, for somebody from the big city, personal safety is an issue. And, and we have something here that they want. Um, there, there's a whole uh, trend, it's, it's now a couple decades old, it's called um, uh, new urbanism. And it's the whole idea that you build these giant shopping complexes and they incorporate stores and upper story apartments and little parks. Jordan Creek is an example of, of kind of new urbanism. And my point was always, well, they're building what we already have. We have stores downtown with apartments overhead and a park nearby and lots of places to eat and drink and see a movie. So in, in essence, small town is new urbanism. It's what people want and the sort of experience they want. We just don't know how to tell people about it sometimes and explain to them that this sort of community um, has real benefits. And here's another picture. This is Sac City uh, up in Northwest Iowa. They recently had a benefactor, someone who grew up in town and had a business there. I think he farmed, as a matter of fact, who left $4 million to the community gave it to the community foundation and said, you guys figure out how to use this money to make this town better, which is a great gift. You know, the problem was they couldn't agree on how to spend the money. <laughs> if you've ever been through downtown Albia, the entire square around the courthouse was many of the facades were restored and it's a, it's a spectacular place because of one benefactor. And, People would come to me and say, hey, USDA, 
we need a grant for this, or can you give us some free money to do something in our community? My first question, my response often was, we can, um, but do you have a community foundation? Because your community foundation has 10 times more capacity to give you a grant than the USDA does. And then I started, you know, started talking about the fact that contributions from people who live in town who want to leave a legacy, making that investment in their community foundations would make the government irrelevant. The government would not be needed because everything that you would need as a community could be generated by your community foundation thanks to the philanthropy of the people who live there or who lived there. Um, I, I, I know many of you have heard my speech about transfer of wealth, and that's the, 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 those are the estates that will leave when people here pass away and will go to their kids who live in Chicago, Minneapolis, or Washington, D.C. And Iowa State has, has estimated that transfer of wealth between now and 2050 at about half a trillion dollars, collectively as a state. My point was, what if you could capture 2% of that half a trillion dollars and put it in community foundations? That's why government becomes irrelevant, because we can take care of ourselves and we don't need to grovel for grants and ask, ask somebody to give us a little bit of money to build a new school building or fix up a library to turn it into an arts center or restore our facades. We could do it ourselves. Um, but which gets me to government. Because there's an important role for government. And when people would ask me, why is the Department of Agriculture doing this? And it's because um, you know, the future of rural America is, is linked to the future of American agriculture. How, how did we get involved? Well, as I told you before, we had a, a quarter of a trillion dollar portfolio of loans and grants. So we would make direct loans to a community or to a nonprofit to help them build a hospital or a clinic or a fire station or help them buy a tornado siren something to make their community more secure or we would give a loan guarantee to a couple that wanted to buy a house in town it would allow them to go to the local bank they put no money down uh, on that house and and the government would guarantee 90 percent of the loan so if they defaulted the government would cover the bank. It would make the bank more willing to make that loan, that sort of a guarantee. Same sort of guarantee exists for small businesses. Um, a small business in a small town wants to start or expand or buy some equipment. They could come to USDA. USDA would guarantee that loan through the bank. And that way, if the, bank, if the, if the business went under, the, the bank was guaranteed. So it's an incentive to loan. Access to equity is a huge challenge in small towns because rural Americans are risk averse. You wouldn't think that would be the case when you have an economy based on agriculture and agriculture is inherently risky because you can't control the weather or prices or international trade. Um, at the same time, rural Americans are conservative and careful with their money. Maybe that's the, the point there, but, but it's hard to get equity into small towns. And USDA, by guaranteeing mortgages, small business loans, um, the loans to build multifamily apartment complexes or senior living complexes, um, that, that's, that's one of the important roles that we would play. But, but you think about what, what does it take to have uh, a quality of life in a small town? I would always narrow it down. You gotta have a place to live. You gotta have a good job. You gotta have clean water. And you've gotta have a strong, secure community. And I'm convinced you can bundle everything, every element of life into one of those buckets. Now people would say, well, what about arts and culture? I'd say, eh, strong, secure community. I mean, the elements of quality of life that go into, whether it's your school, whether it's your hospital, whether it's your art center, whether it's your downtown movie theater, I mean, that's that community component. And, and, and what government does, and the reason it gets involved, is because if left on their own devices, or left to their own devices, um, those things might not happen. They, those investments might not be made. The banks might not make that loan to that young family or to that entrepreneur uh, or to that, that innovator 
who wants to grow his or her business on the edge of town, and the next thing you know, they have 150 employees. I mean, that, that's the, the whole reason. And, and you know, I, again, we're gonna talk about rural electrification next week and, and rural telephone and, and rural broadband and, and sort of the rationale for that. But, but Congress was very deliberate in its decisions to create these various programs. They didn't just create the programs, they continue to fund them. They're the appropriations engine. So every time you hear that the government's gonna shut down on September 30th and the money will stop flowing, that includes all of these programs. But it's because Congress controls the purse. And, and they choose to keep funding this because they see the value in supporting these small towns. Now it's changing. And it, sometimes it comes down to philosophical differences and views of government versus you know, private sector. Um, but I remain convinced that, that without some sort of government bump, um, you will not see investments made in small towns if, left, if ROI, return on investment, is the only um, barometer that you, that you use to review what, what, how those decisions are made. Um, I think that, that community is an important element too, and, and it's something that, that my agency did not get a lot of uh, credit for, uh, nor the other USDA agencies that work in communities, or the Small Business Administration, um, or even State of Iowa. But, but it's building capacity in towns to help them think strategically about what they do and how they're gonna move forward uh, is something that takes work. Uh, to come to a, uh, to create a, a meeting like this and have people break down and start talking about their place is not is not a, something that that community leaders in rural places automatically think about and, and it's something that at rural development we had staff people that would go out into small towns and help them develop plans uh, at the state of Iowa, the Department of Economic Development, or now it's called the Iowa Economic Development Authority, does the same thing. Iowa State has something similar through extension. Um, but there are over 900 communities in this state, most of which are under 500 in population. And to go to those small towns and say, you know what, you gotta have a strategic plan, we'll give you some money if you come up with a vision for your future, go do it. Uh, they would look at you with blank stares. But if you would go in, you would say, I'm coming to your community next week, let's have a meeting of your community leadership, and let's start thinking about what you need. Because maybe the mayor had called me and said, hey, we have a housing crisis. And my response would say, would be, what kind of housing? And the mayor's response would be, I don't know, housing. So that prompts the conversation about, let's actually do an assessment of what it is that you need, why you need it, and how we can help. And this sort of, this sort of strategic thinking and then strategic doing um, needs help. Someone's gotta spur that or help that community do that. Now some places are amazing and they can do it on their own. I was with uh, the mayor of Manning, Iowa recently, Manning is just an amazing place. I think their population is 1,700. They've been the Small Business Administration's business city of the year in the past. They beat out Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, Sioux City, and Des Moines. <laughs> because Manning is remarkable. Because they have this core group of leaders that have, through the force of their will and personality and knowledge and, and skill sets, done amazing things. Um, if, if we could bottle what Manning has and take it to other towns of 1700, we would have the greatest economy in the world. But, but it was all driven by the people. And the question becomes, how do you help empower the people in small towns to make these sorts of strategic decisions? And I'll tell you that, that somebody's gotta help. And it's not free. And if you ask the towns to pay for that sort of technical assistance, they don't have those resources. So that's where government gets involved to help at least help spur those conversations. Uh, and, and the other thing about small towns is that we are, we're a melting pot. Maybe not a melting pot of societies or, or cultures, but we're a melting pot of peoples and ages 
and I've had some chances to work with AARP recently because they have something called a livability index. And um, they're trying to convince communities as they plan to do it in a way that encourages multi-generational interaction, which means more and better sidewalks, which means different entries into stores. With the whole purpose being, we want to make sure that everybody can get into a store or a public space or cross a street safely or start a business and be successful. That, that vision of livability doesn't mean livability for senior citizens. It means livability for everybody and creating spaces where they all can work and live together. So that, that's why I wanted to include that. Um, this is a hospital in Shenandoah. World Development helped, um, helped finance it. We did a $12 million loan. They also raised about $5 million locally to do this. And um, that goes to that core health care. And um, I am the chair-elect of the Iowa Rural Health Association. And in November, we're going to be having our annual meeting here at the Hotel Grinnell. We'll have people from all over the state coming. And the thing we're going to talk about at this conference are what's known as the social determinants of health, which is what are the factors in a town that impact your health or how healthy or well you are. I mean, clearly having access to a hospital or a clinic is good. I mean, when, when you get sick, you drive over to the hospital or get that test and they take care of you. But what is it about your environment? your socioeconomic situation, uh, your community's sidewalk structure, the food that you eat, what are those social elements that determine whether or not you're healthy? And it's something that, that hospitals are looking at, something that housing advocates are looking at. I mean, certainly having a house is a good thing if you want to have a healthy life. If you, are, if you don't have a place to live, your health might be um, not so good, it might be compromised. So I just want to, health is, is, a, is an undercurrent that runs through small towns. We, we talked about why life expectancy might be lower in rural places, and I mentioned access to health care. Someone reminded me, Tommy, that in fact, farming is a dangerous business. I mean, there are accidents, um, there is, um, you are, you are brought in contact with, with chemicals that can have long-term implications. There could be another explanation for the, the shorter life expectancy in rural is that the, the work is more dangerous, the jobs, whether it's in manufacturing or, or meat processing or livestock or agricultural production, it, it's, it's harder work, more dangerous, and in some cases your body just wears out sooner. Um, and then the whole week, we'll, we'll make that, that circle back to, to agriculture and how we feed ourselves. And again, government is, is an important player in that. Um, when we talk about mitigating risk, in farming is a risky business, and there's no doubt that, that growing fruits and vegetables or niche meats uh, is really risky because you're relying on a localized um, constituency of, of would-be customers. So when Andy and Melissa Dunham want to sell their kale, they, they're only going out a certain area. And if, if they have a bad week or one of their customers drops them, the impact on their operation is significant. Now the federal government does a great job with crop insurance for, for commodity producers. Um, and they're writing big checks right now to, to compensate soybean producers, especially for the trade um, impact that, that, that the trade decisions, the trade war is having on soybean and corn and other commodity uh, groups. Soybeans are getting the biggest chunk of money from that. The government isn't as worried about producers who grow asparagus or beets or kale or um, other fruits and vegetables. And that's traditionally how the crop insurance programs have worked, is they don't take as good care of them. They, there were some attempts to change that during the Obama administration. Uh, it did, there were a few changes made. We have to figure out a way to make it safer for people who have family farms who are growing 
fruits and vegetables and things that we actually can eat uh, to make it uh, less risky for them. Uh, and at the end of the day, that relationship that we have with the folks who farm in our community, and we get to see it twice a week at the farmer's market, and we get to see them at the grocery store, and we interact with producers every day, you know, that, that interaction, we, we sometimes try to figure out how we bridge the gap between urban and rural. There's also a challenge of bridging the gap between town and country. And having you all in this room today is a, a great example of that. And, and how do, at the end of the day, how do we have a conversation? I remember um, Howard McDonough and I spoke to a group of farmers a couple of years ago, and one of the questions was, how do we get those folks in town to understand what, what we do? And Howard said, when was the last time you had them out to your farm? And they said, never. Howard, I have them out to the farm all the time. Sometimes they just have to see it for themselves because even people in town may not appreciate the complexity, the risk, uh, and, and the sheer impact of technology of what they're doing. So, we're, uh, Janet's given me the uh, eyebrow instead of the clock. So I'd like to open it up in these last couple minutes, open it up to a conversation um, about, about just your initial thoughts. Again, I, I really think that we have some value to add to these statewide conversations about how we support rural. Uh, in fact, I spent an hour on the phone yesterday with a reporter for the Des Moines Register, a business reporter who said, she initially said, what do you think about the differences between Reynolds and Hubble on rural policy? <laughs> and I said, well, I, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I want to get into that because I'm, so I'm wearing this hat as the executive director for 10 hours a week of the Rural Development Council. And again, the Rural Development Council is staff to the governor's office on this Empower Rural Iowa initiative. And it's not a partisan initiative, but certainly she's running for, for re-election. So I think I kind of danced around that question, but I started talking about the, the things that the, the task force is looking at, broadband housing, rural leadership. And she said, well, do you have any case studies for towns that have really great broadband and their businesses are doing great? And I started, you know, West Liberty, Jefferson, um, you know, places like that. And she said, oh, well, can you give me some lists of businesses that, so I think there's an increasing interest in this conversation about how small towns can thrive and what the, what the resources are. And, and it's a much bigger um, pot of, of issues than just housing, broadband, and leadership. But that's, again, that's her biting off the, the lowest hanging fruit so she, we, the bottom line is we want to have recommendations by November. The next governor can take them to the legislature and say, here's an opportunity for us. So I think what, what we can come up with over the next few weeks is our, our few other ideas to add to that list. Al. Could you give us a couple, could you give us a couple of examples from the Manning experience that you observed on things that they were able to do as a very small community with a dedicated team looking at these kinds of questions? What did Manning do that, that we could take as an example for our community? Um, they have a, a, a very broad um, group of people that are engaged, number one. And sometimes in small towns, and I'm a perfect example of this, I'm a usual suspect. If somebody wants to have a meeting about something in town, they will, I will often get a call because I'm part of the usual suspects. There are people that we never think about who would be amazing uh, individuals to contribute in one way or another who don't get invited. And maybe it's because they look different, sound different, um, they're in a wheelchair, they have some, dis I mean, they're poor, they're homeless. We don't always um, open the doors to new kind of um, uh, people. And in Manning, they did that. Manning raised a bunch of money, they built a new hospital. Um, they used USDA to do it, but they had the community support to do that. Uh, they have supported expanding uh, manufacturers in town. They're a Main Street community, so they're very proactive in how they operate their downtown. 
uh, and they played well with others. Um, you know, Matt, they're, they're just down the road from Templeton, and they recognize that Templeton has all these people that come there to, to drink rye, or at least see where the rye is now being made. And they played well with Carroll, too, and Carroll is a regional hub. So I will say that, that the core group of leaders in Manning um, have done an amazing job of sim simply thinking broadly and having lots of people weigh in and then being really successful at what they decide to do. And I guess the question is, how do you be successful as you work well together and you raise money and you contribute? Yes? Hang on. Uh, I have kids oh, what? on what? Sorry. Okay. You go ahead. I have kids on going on the uh, right ride. And they went through a few of these towns, and Jefferson's one they mentioned. And this year, they don't allow anybody to sell food inside, and, and their attitude towards some of these towns that would not allow people into town, but wanted everybody to go outside of town to buy food, really uh, discouraged them from those towns. Now, was that a decision that Jefferson made or that the register made? I think it was Jefferson's. In individual places, and you know, the towns could really do something if they open themselves up. I, I think Grinnell did the same thing when we hosted a couple of years ago. I think that they put a limit on who could sell what, when, and where. So, and I think part of that was self-preservation. Let's make sure that our existing businesses are, are supported before the folks from the pie makers from out of town or the chicken man comes in. So that's just my initial thought. George. Yeah, um, in your observation working with all these communities, the relationship between the city government and Chamber of Commerce and informal leadership, how does that work and is it critical to have the city government uh, strong or can you work around that? You can work around it, but you're better off if everyone's playing well together. We have some small towns that have were the, the, the city manager or the city clerk, because a lot of very small towns don't have a city manager. The clerk runs the show, and then you have the council and the mayor. Um, and a lot of times they just abdicate. They, we're, we're, we're not in the business or we're not in a position to do this. Talk to the chamber director or talk to the banker. Uh, in those places where they abdicate, they're poorer for that, because cities can be even if, even if it's not their money, they can be conduits for support, whether it's from USDA or from the state government, that, that can't happen. But I'll throw in county government as well, because a lot of these counties, um, Michael Gartner of the Des Moines Register, NBC News fame, was the first um, chair of Iowa, uh, the Iowa Vision Iowa program. And Mike was the one who made the, the decision that any project seeking Vision Iowa funding had to have some money from the county. And somebody from one of the counties said, why is that? He said, because you are the last bastion of pay-as-you-go government. Counties are never willing to take on debt, but they have great capacity to do amazing things for the county, for the communities in their county. So I would say the city's gotta be a player, the county's gotta be a player, the Chamber and Economic Development Group, obviously, but um, the Community Foundation has to be at the table, all of the banks, all of the realtors. I mean, it's, 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 it's that collective impact model where the more people you have at the table that are engaged and participating, the better off you are. But if the city's not there, um, to people like me, that waves, uh, raises a red flag. Yes, Jim. Yes, money. Is there a place for the area community colleges to fit into all this? Everywhere. Um, now, and the challenge is, is that the community colleges serve these giant districts. So if, if uh, you know, Grinnell goes to Iowa Valley and says, we'd like you to be a player or an investor, uh, the community college might say, yes, we'll get to you after we do Ellsworth and Iowa Falls and, you know, Marshalltown. So that, that's a challenge. But in fact, um, from a rural development standpoint, we have really great participation from the community colleges because they're not just educators and they're not just doing workforce training and workforce development. They're really doing economic development too. 
So I would want them to be at the table in some capacity, even if it's just there to share what they have. They have resources, again, that flow through the state for workforce training, that if you have a business coming to town and they need a certain skill set that doesn't exist, the community college can create a program to train those workers in something they currently don't have and use state money to do that. You mentioned, you mentioned the health uh, group that we meet with recently soon. Uh, my, one thing that group might do would be to enable town to test their water for nitrates. As I understand, St. Des Moines is one of the few that actually does that, and it's been acknowledged to the media at least that some other towns are known to have that problem. They just don't know how bad it is because they don't test. Could hospitals provide some of the te technology or means to test more wells and other sources that smaller towns have for water? Well, asking a hospital to help do that would be a challenge to have the hospital help lead the discussion as a community about what sort of water quality do we have would be a great thing. You know, I know that that as the, so every, communities have these DNR permits, the Department of Natural Resources, that, that limits what sort of the quality of the water that comes out of their wastewater treatment systems at the end of the process. And right now, uh, they don't require any mitigation of phosphorus or nitrogen. I mean, and those are the things, the, the, the nitrates that flow back into the rivers that create algae, that create the dead zone in the Gulf. Um, I think that that's a much bigger conversation, which is when is the DNR and when is the state of Iowa going to start requiring communities to treat for phosphorus and nitrogen? Then, for a small town, the question becomes, how are we going to pay for that? I mean, Grinnell's, I think, doing a 10 or $12 million upgrade on their wastewater treatment system. How do you, how do you get a small town to, to start treating the water as they have to, to protect our, our waterways, to give us the clean water that I mentioned earlier, and not break, break the bank doing that? But that's, that's a very good example of a large government entity taking that responsibility and doing that. And that's, that, you're exactly right. Somebody's going to have to take responsibility for that, and in theory, it probably should be the state, or if not the state, the EPA. And at this moment, neither is going to happen. But but there's always tomorrow. Bill, thank you so much. Been a we'll see you next week. Thank you for the electrification electrification stories ready for me. Yeah.